Hey, I want to continue talking about fairness today, which makes the question easy what we talked about last time. So what did we talk about last time? Yes, thanks, fairness. <laughs> so is there anything that you remember from that lecture worth taking away? Um, that it's really hard to do and like um, the difference between ethics and legal things. Mm -hmm. And we were essentially talking about uh, why to be ethical as software engineers and uh, and we, we ran into like things like how do you define what's ethical? That's also depends upon people and the society and things yes. like that. Yes. Anything else, anybody? One more. Speak up, don't type. <laughs> or type. Um, so one thing we talked about is how um, discrimination is sort of domain specific. Mm -hmm. um, so right. In certain domains and in many fields there are legal doctrines, but then there's also the discrimination that's, that's more specific to specific problems, right? And last time we talked mostly about all these problems and why it's so hard, right? Today I want to talk a little bit about tools that we have to build fairer systems. So I'm, I'm not, these are not sim simple universal solutions, right? Everything is hard, but it's kind of a toolbox of things that we can use for different parts of this. And there are two parts that I want to cover today. Um, one is fairness assessment of the model. This is actually where you see most of the um, machine learning research focuses on this much more. And then there's kind of system level fairness engineering, um, kind of which focuses more on requirements engineering, thinking maybe about the teams and about what kind of data you can collect. Um, there's slowly more attention on this. I think the paper that you read is a very good example of people actually caring about this in production and not just caring about the properties of the model. They made a lot of arguments about this in the paper as well. So I wanna to try to cover both things today. Um, the first part is much better researched and there are better tools for this and, um, uh, and things uh, to use. Um, but I think the second part is probably actually in practice the more important one. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of different scenarios that will come up and you can already start thinking about kind of fairness considerations. The one that everybody talks about is recidivism, right? So whether you should uh, grant somebody, release somebody from jail early or grant bail or things like this. We can talk about cancer detection. Uh, where, for example, we want the tool to be equally good across gender or races. And then we can talk about things that are, um, don't have a societal or medical impl implications immediately, like audio transcription, what kind of fairness uh, ex uh, problems could we see there, right? And this was, again, in the readings, uh, were a lot of kind of those domains, uh, which are maybe more the kind of things that I would expect some of you to work on if you join some company and work on some project, right? Um, there might be some things that have a um, that have a legal strong legal requirements, but I think a lot of them are more kind of we want to be fair, we want to be ethical, um, right? So what can we do to avoid um, kind of problems uh, in our software? So let's start with fairness definitions. Uh, there are actually a bunch of them. Um, and a bunch of them are a bit more mathematical. Um, there's actually a huge amount of research in this field right now. There are conferences just on fairness, lots and lots of papers on different strategies on fairness. Um, a bunch of um, tutorials as well, if you wanna go more into this, I think those are good starting points. This is also where I took some of the material. And then you can go all back into the philosophy and kind of the legal roots of fairness. There's actually a huge amount of literature that goes back many, many years. What do we consider fair? What uh, should the government 
how should we kind of regulate fairness and so on. And there are a couple of different things. I don't want to go too deeply into this, um, but if you're interested in this topic, especially if you look at the more societal dimensions of things, I think it's worth to read up on this. Um, for example, there's statistical discrimination um, where like higher premiums for male drivers, right? So you treat different groups differently to achieve a certain outcome. Um, and then there's taste-based uh, discrimination, um, which is a term for, there's not actually a real statistical reason underneath. And typically you forego some benefits because you're discriminating against somebody. For example, you might not hire the better candidate because they're female or because they are from a certain background, even though they are better, right? So you're kind of foregoing a certain benefit in order to uh, discriminate. And this could be intentional because you just don't like that minority group, or it could be out of ignorance that you actually have a belief um, that they are um, just lazy or, or something like this, right? Um, for legal doctrine, uh, you typically look at the motivations that somebody acts with discriminatory purpose. Uh, although there are also cases where, um, especially in housing and in some domains where you look at the outcome independent of intention. So in, in, in housing, for example, there's this doctrine of disparate impact. So whether you intentionally or uh, unintentionally discriminate uh, doesn't matter. What matters is that the outcomes are the same in the end, that you're not, uh, that you have uh, similar outcomes for different groups. Um, I don't want to go into this much more. Um, I just want to open up with this kind of complicated, there are lots of discussions around this, lots of different perspectives and lots of roots. And this makes fairness measurements so difficult because people mean different things and have different goals. So at the level of algorithmic fairness, so that's what we are looking at when we're looking at the model level. If we want to discuss whether a model is fair, there are a couple of definitions. Actually, there are lots of definitions. I'm just going to go through a few in today's lecture um, that have different trade-offs. The first and maybe most naive strategy is anti-classification, which simply means let's not use the protected attributes. Right, so um, essentially when we're making a decision about um, recidivism, about whether somebody could, should get bail or go to jail, we should simply not look at gender, we should simply not look at race, we should simply not look at income, for example, whatever we consider as protected attributes. Right? So we just remove it from the training data or we remove it from the inputs that we give into the system. Right? So we simply ensure that the system cannot use those attributes to make decisions. So why is this potentially a little bit naive? What are advantages and disadvantages of this approach? So strong indica indirect indicators may remain in the data, right? So it's very common that you have a lot of data points that correlate in your data. Right? Um, we talked about this as proxies last time, like the zip code might be a very strong proxy uh, for race, for example. Right? Um, the school that you went to might be a weak proxy for gender. Right? So this is one example, one thing that you want to avoid. Um, what are other reasons that might um, this is probably the main one, but what are other reasons where this might be not a good strategy? So this might be fairer, but less accurate. That's actually true for almost all interventions that we do because by imposing fairness constraints, uh, we reduce the accuracy often, or um, we, we impose constraints on the model. The model is less expressive and as a consequence, there's often um, um, less, less accuracy overall, at least for some groups. Um, right, um, Citron has a good point here. Um, it might conflict with a task where in some tasks you actually may need uh, the information 
because you want different outcomes for different people. So we talked about proxies before, and this was the example of um, sometimes you actually want, prote want to use protected attributes because it's really important. You would have unfair outcomes if you don't use those attributes. Right? So in medical domains, um, it actually may make a difference whether you're treating a man or a woman um, for a certain kind of diseases, right? So just hiding that attribute will not make the system better or fair in general. Um, you have other examples other than medicine? Oh, we talked about this last time, right? Um, depends on the domain. There, there, there are lots of these examples where you actually want to use this. So let's assume we want to achieve anti-classification, right? We're talking about other approaches later. Um, how do we do this at a technical level? I think I already mentioned this, it's technically straightforward. So what, what would you do? Yeah, just remove the features, right? Remove the features from the training set, um, drop the columns. Um, you typically need to identify which columns are the protected columns, right? So there's some requirements engineering in there, but you just drop them. And then you also drop them from when you're, whenever you're asking queries, right? Um, also, instead of dropping them, you could zero them out or something like this. Um, and you could test that they're actually dropped, for example. Um, how could you test that this has actually happened in the system? If you're just giving a model, and you want to make sure that the model was not trained on that feature? Could you do something like, um, I don't know if this is the right term, but some sort of mutation test where you basically take the same input and make one, say, male and one female and check that you get the same output? Yep. We actually had this example before. This is from a previous um, lecture where we talked about invariance. Right, so this is one of the simpler invariants to test where you just take any data point and you flip the gender and you see that you get the same output. Right, if the output ever, even just a single time matters, it means somewhere you've trained on this feature. Right, or somewhere you're not cleaning the feature before it gets to the model. Um, and you can just do random testing for this. Um, you could also potentially say, give a fairness metric here, but the, I'm not sure how, how useful that is. Um, so this is fairly straightforward, and then you can use just the entire toolbox of random testing that we talked about before. Um, with regard to correlated features and proxies, there's a bit more research um, on identifying which features are correlated, and typically the strategy is to remove those as well. Um, I haven't looked into this research more carefully um, if you wanted to go that route. I also want to mention, um, and this comes up with all the next things as well, um, this is a super active field with very long roots in other fields, like fairness has all these roots in other uh, fields in, in philosophy and so on, um, and lots and lots of papers. There doesn't seem to be a huge amount of consistency for terminology. Um, there are a couple of terms that are, or the same concept is usually described in a bunch of terms and many people, papers actually mention a lot of synonyms for a lot of these strategies. For example, anti-classification is also described as fairness by blindness or as causal fairness. And there are a couple of other terms for this and you see this with all the other ones. So maybe just in case you ever get into this domain uh, and you talk to somebody, um, you may need to kind of negotiate a little bit until you have a shared understanding of what the actual notion of fairness is that they're talking about. You may not know the, them by the same term. Um, so fairness by, um, fairness by blindness or kind of anti-classification, that's the simplest approach, but it breaks down immediately if you have kind of correlated features. There are a couple of other strategies. There's actually a huge class of things called classification parity, um, where you want to equalize groups across some sort of accuracy measure, typically. So some sort of classification error should be equal across groups. 
um, there are a bunch of those. And to do this, we, we kind of need to introduce a little bit of notation. Um, who's familiar with how to read these uh, kind of probabilis uh, probability descriptions? I assume if you've taken a machine learning class, you've seen these. Can I just raise your hand if you can read those? I see two hands, three hands. Um, so let, let me describe them at least briefly. Um, so this is a probability of, in, in some set of observations, the probability that R is one under the condition that A is zero. So you can think of this as um, if you have a data set, you have some data with R one and some data with R zero, the probability essentially just tells you what's the percentage of all the observations in a statistical sense or in this data set where R is one. And this is a subset. So you can think of this as subsets of other sets. So if you think of all the observations, just take the subset of all the observations where A is wrong or is zero, right? And then I want to discuss the probability or the percentage of cases where R is one. So the way that this is described here is we have a bunch of features. R is the regression score or the outcome. Um, A is the sensitive attribute, for example, gender or race. And why is the target variable? So in this case, what we're describing is we want to know the probability that our predictor says true. Let's say um, somebody gets released on bail, right? The probability that somebody gets released on bail for all the people where the protected attribute is zero should be the same probability that somebody gets released from uh, with bail if the protected attribute is one. Does this make sense? So if you divide the entire population into two groups and you look at the performance of the predictor in both groups, in this case, you're just expecting that the same percentage of individuals um, gets accepted or gets released from prison. Um, so um, Jake asks whether the percentage should be um, equal. Depends a little bit what you're going for. Typically you can't achieve perfect equality here. So you probably want to be within a certain range, right? So within a certain error margin that you're accepting. Um, but yes, so the goal is if you want real fairness, this, this here this is described as independence, statistical parity, demographic parity, or group fairness, or disparate impact, you want the same rate of accepted results for both groups, right? So the predicted rate of recidivism is the same across all races, or the chances of promotion are the same across all genders. Make sense? So here's an example of just a test set, you see, uh, um, uh, of cancer diagnosis. So we have a thousand data samples, 500 male, 500 female patients. And we want to know whether the classifier that we're using to sample them is fair. So with our definition of independence just now, is this fair? What's the acceptance rate for male patients? So acceptance rate looks at the outcome of the predictions, right? So how often do we predict that somebody has cancer for male patients. Can't do that 2%, why 2%? What's the computation? Isn't it uh, six plus three over 500? 
Yep. Yeah. So nine out of 500. Yeah, which is about 2%. Uh, for female patients? Two percent, but slightly higher. <laughs> yeah, eleven out of five hundred, right? So, uh, ten true positive, one false positive, so eleven positive results. And now, I guess we come back to the epsilon, right? The error rate, um, whether we consider nine versus eleven to be fair or unfair, right? So there's there's kind of a judgment involved, um, whether that's close enough or not. But that's that's essentially what this definition says. Right, so the rate of acceptance should be independent of the group. So what's the advantage or the disadvantage of the of this? Compare this with anti-discrimination that we just talked about before. It assumes we know the groups, at least we need, we need to have separate, we need to know the groups for the evaluation, which is fairly common in most of these measures. Um, this is a high level strategy that you could impose later, right? You can kind of adjust the model later. Um, how does this model deal with proxies or are proxies an issue? assumes that there's no causal link to the gender feature. I mean, you could actually use the gender feature here, right? So you could do different predictions for men and women. You could learn based on gender and you can learn on any proxy based on gender as well. As long as the outcomes are comparable. Right, the number of people who you diagnose with cancer is comparable. The number of people who you release on bail is comparable. The number of people who you offer, offer an apartment when they apply for rent is comparable. Um, what are some of the limitations? How can you game this? Or what are the problems? The where is this? Problematic, what does it not capture? Does it make sense in the cancer case? What a, it doesn't look into true positives for fa and false positives. So it's, um, it actually doesn't look at accuracy at all, right? If you just randomly diagnose 10% of all people with cancer, this would be fair according to this metric, right? Even if it's completely wrong or if it's, if it's good predictions for one group and terrible predictions for the other group, that's fine according to this metric, right? It's independent. Um, the other thing is if cancer is more common among men than women in our population, does this make sense? Jake, is, is this what you were trying to get at with your statement? Yeah, because it's it's um it's very objective, you know. Unlike some other things, like maybe deciding recidivism or something, you can. It's a concrete reality that the person does or doesn't have cancer. So yeah, I mean there could be different distributions among different populations. 
Um, so it, it wouldn't really make sense to um, try to try to level it off as a result. Um, with recidivism, you actually have a similar thing. So what you're observing there is whether somebody will commit another crime in the next two or three years. And they're actually, if you look at the different populations, they commit another crime with different probabilities. Women are actually less likely to commit another crime um, statistically, right? So if we just say we should release the same number of women and men, that's potentially unfair to the women, right? Because we release them at proportionally lower rates than they would commit another crime. So it's really easy to kind of be lazy and just release it, or make the predictions for the same number of people independent of how good the predictions are. Right? It completely ignores potential correlations between um, the protected attribute and the outcome. Right? Um, and there's no requirement for accuracy. This is very, in, in law sometimes this is used, this is also called um, disparate impact, which I think is a legal term for this, which is for example used in housing. So if in housing you're giving, um, you're rejecting applicants from a certain background more frequently than from other backgrounds, independently of any other things, you might get into trouble, right? So um, there's also, you can actually game the system and um, start um, hiring only the worst candidates of the underrepresented groups, right? So you uh, intentionally hire poor performing people in the underrepresented group, only then to later show, oh, see, people from that group are performing poorly, right? We hired them with the same rate. We gave them a chance, but they are performing poorly. And this way, kind of confirm your, your bias, right? So this form of um, independence completely doesn't look at kind of accuracy or qualities. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's sometimes useful, but it's a very kind of limited form. Um, if you want to test for this, this is also harder than testing for, um, um, for anti-classification uh, because you actually need to look at realistic distributions. Um, you can't just randomly make up people and then you get nonsensical features for them. Um, you actually need to draw from a realistic population. Um, we talked about this in the lecture on uh, random automated random testing, there are a couple of strategies to do this, um, but typically you need to provide a probability distribution of your population, for example, with probabilistic programming or something like this from which you can draw. And that needs to actually reflect the population if you wanna do any sort of testing. And then you could randomly generate kind of realistic people, or you take a subset of production data or telemetry data, um, and then you just measure the, the the rate of positive predictions for both, right? So it's fairly easy to test in production or to collect data in production if you, if you have the protected attribute. Um, you don't even need the outcome, right? So you don't even need to know whether it was a good prediction or not. Uh, just see whether you have the same rate of predictions, um, right? Let's see. Um, if you have um, a predictor that gives you a number and you need to have a threshold to adjust. Uh, you can calibrate these results by just picking different thresholds for both populations until they're equal. This is fairly straightforward here. If your predictor only accepts a very small percentage from one group and a high percentage from another group, just make it more challenging to predict people from a certain group by adjusting the threshold. Right? So you could calibrate this, um, which, achieves some sort of equity, right? So this is why this is also used in housing to come back to this, right? To achieve similar outcomes for both groups. The same number of people get promoted in both groups, the same number of people get released in both groups, um, but it's not necessarily equal in a sense, right? So they get different amount of uh, support. So in one group, it might, be, might get much, much easier to get promoted just because the threshold is, much, is calibrated so much uh, lower just to achieve this measure of independence. Make sense? So there's kind of this conflict between equality and equity and different goals and different metrics um, 
represent them in different ways, right? They are blind or calibrated to different things. Does independence so far make sense? So let's look at another one um, called separation or equalized odds, or there are a bunch of other terms as well. So what we're trying to achieve here is that the false positive rates and the false negative rates are the same across groups, right? So what you're, what you're looking at here is the rate that we're doing a negative prediction given that somebody is in the minority group and the outcome should be true, right? So these are false positives, I think. So we're predicting zero, but it should be one. That should be the same as um, for the other group, right? So the rates of false positives, uh, the label here is wrong, right? The top one is comparing false positives, the lower one comparing true the false negatives, okay. Um, you can do this for all kinds of things. You can compare accuracy, you can compare false positives, you can compare false negatives, you can compare recall, you can compare precision and so on, right? So the goal is always that you have some quality metric that's the same across both groups. So equalized odds um, or separation is a one way you try to um, or equalized odds is comparing false positives and false negatives. So the idea is that we're making the same percentage of mistakes in both groups. Oops, so let's, let's look at the cancer example again. What's the rate of false positives for men? I mean, we already have the confusion matrix. We can just look it up, right? Three out of 500 and for women, one out of 500. And the fall, uh, rate of false negatives is five out of 500 versus one out of 500, right? So we see differences in those rates. And again, we can decide whether this is in an acceptable range or whether that's too, too big of a difference. Right? At least on this sample that we see that we have way more false negatives and false positives for men than for women. Right? The, so the classifier is performing worse for men than for women in both directions actually. We could also just compare uh, accuracy, we could compare recall, we could compare precision. Um, these are all different um, parity metrics. Uh, different versions of them and which one you would use depends kind of on the on the thing that you're trying to achieve. Um, when would you use separation rather than independence? When do you want to have similar false positive rates rather than similar outcomes? Would that be recidivism? Because you don't, it's okay to, you know, correctly predict it, but it's not okay to continually make mistakes about one group. Yes. So this is, this is more commonly used. I think this is the kind of thing that's typically used in recidivism, where you say you want to be fair in the sense that if somebody commits another crime, then we want to keep them in jail with the same likelihood, right? We want to, um, we want to make same, um, same decisions for both groups. And then if this ends up that more men go to jail than women, that's something that we can live with because it's still fair because we, we don't make more mis the men don't end up because we make more mistakes. And if you think about this equality, equal, uh, equity um, thing is we don't have the same outcomes, right? We get different outcomes for men and women in jail but we have kind of the same chances, right? Um, it's more of an equality than an equity approach here, um, where given that somebody 
will or will not commit a, a new crime, we will detect it with similar accuracy. And depending on what, you, what you're going for here, um, you might just compare about uh, the false positive rate or just the false negative rate or accuracy overall. That depends really what is the worst outcome. There's actually a lot of utility function engineering. You can think about um, what's the cost of a false positive for society and for the defendant. What's the cost of a true positive for society and the defendant and so on. And then kind of balance that also utility is, is similar across functions. So in the paper that I recommended um, um, about measurement and mismeasurement of, um, of fairness, they go into more detail into this direction, kind of weighing this with utility, kind of figuring out for different people what's the utility of different outcomes, what's the utility for society, for, peop for individuals. Um, and you can use this also to calibrate this and make decisions. You can push this quite far. And then what the paper also argues is that even that's probably not fair in the end because um, um, I forgot the argument. Um, yeah, they, they have some argument um, to kind of think about the larger society and the impact that's not just by comparing um, these rates and kind of calibration only helps to some degree. It's actually way more complex if you kind of think about society. Um, I would have to look at the paper for details again. So testing, again, I think once you commit to the specific metric, I think testing for it, monitoring it isn't too hard. Um, but in this case, you actually need, need the true outcome, right? So you need to be able to measure um, the rate of true positives in production. And if you can do this, you can do this separately for different demographics, right? So you can separately assess true positives for men and women or for different races or for different, um, different other categories, and then just monitor that in production there at a similar level. You can also split your training set this way. Uh, we talked about this in the testing lecture also that you may have separate test sets for different population and just see that they're doing similarly well in those populations. Um, so the, the actual measurement itself, I think is not too hard. Does this make sense? Is this something that you could think about implementing? Vivek? Yeah, uh, I have a question like um, if we don't want to worry about all these factors like um, gender and other things, but we really don't know whether they're going to play a factor or not. Is it like a bad idea to create different models for all of these different types? Would that also oh. count under problem? You can easily build different models. That's perfectly fine. Um, but whether that's fair is unclear. Right? Okay. So you might have a, def a separate model for recidivism for men and women. Mm. And it might just be that your model for women is just trash. Right? It was trained on poor data. It performs very poorly in production. Right? Just right. learning separate models doesn't, doesn't fix this um, if you have garbage data. Okay. Right, so it's similar to the calibration idea. Calibration is one thing to fix it after the fact. You can also calibrate this here, although I'm not sure that you really want to calibrate things by just throwing in a few false positives intentionally. Right? But um, yeah. So for separation, if you want to calibrate, um, you again have uh, these thresholds. You can define different thresholds. So um, if you remember a while ago, we talked about the ROC curves, right? It's kind of the where you can pick a threshold at any of these points, and this will be a trade-off between tr uh, false positive rate and false negative rates, right? At a very um, very low uh, threshold, you have lots of um, you find essentially all of them, but you have lots of false positives or, or the other way around, right? Um, so you can make a lot of decisions here by calibrating where you are in the trade-off between false positives and false negatives, right? So if one model performs much better in terms of false positives and false negatives, you can adjust the threshold a little bit. 
An interesting effect here is that shows again how typically you lose accuracy is there are certain points that you can't achieve. You can only achieve the orange points, which is kind of the intersection of those models. Um, because you can't achieve um, this level of true positive and false negative rate with the other model, right? So this is better in this model than in this one, and this is better in the green model than in the blue model. So you can only um, go for points that can be achieved by both models. I see a bunch of confused faces. Um, does it, I also don't think it matters too much. Um, so, so maybe just briefly, in, in the ROC curve, uh, a better model goes closer to this point up here, right? So it's further out, there's more area under the curve, which means these points here, which are better in general, uh, have better true positive rates and better false positive rates. Those are the desirable points, right? So a better model will have a curve that goes further out, but we can only achieve points that are under the curve. And when we try to find trade-offs for two models that achieve the same trade-off uh, the, the same trade-off between false positives and false negatives, or the same rate of false positives and false negatives, we can only pick points that are reachable by both curves. Right? So if you have models that have different, different curves, you can only find points that are under both curves. And this is fine here, we're not losing predictive power, but it's maybe not the trade-off point that we want to be. So maybe we, we want to be here, which means we're losing power compared to the blue curve. Make sense, roughly? Also, the details don't matter um, too much to me here. Um, I just want to give you an overview of how people think about this, right, and what the, the most common strategies are. Um, so as I said, there are many other related definition uh, of classification parity. Uh, you can just compare the accuracy rates, you can compare recall rates, there are a bunch of forms of calibration. Um, they come under all kinds of different names. In practice, you can all measure them in production if you know what the true, uh, true outcomes are, if you can distinguish false positives and false negatives. Um, um, yeah. This is maybe, just as a curiosity, there are a bunch of papers that show that a lot of these uh, fairness rules are mutually incompatible. There are certain fairness criteria that you can't achieve in the same model. This is maybe more an academic curiosity because in practice you, you kind of need to adjust anyway, right? So, but it kind of means, for example, you can't, uh, you, you typically have to choose between equality or equity goals, right? If you strive for strict equality and you have bias in your system or kind of past bias, you won't achieve equity, right? You won't achieve equal outcome if the opportunities are the same, but the, but the input is kind of biased. Um, so this means in practice you have to really think about what's appropriate for your specific system, right? What are the goals and what's an appropriate fairness measure? Um, let's see. So I think we already talked about this um, in, in the recidivism scenario. So we want to think about whether we should, some, whether somebody will commit another crime is what we want to predict, right? Kind of a risk score. Um, What's the approach that you would use? Anti-classification, independence, or separation? So anti-classification means we're not using um, gender or race, right? Independence means the number of people that we're releasing is the same across gender and race or the percentage, right? And separation means the number of, mis or the percentage of mistakes that we're making is the same across gender or race. What would you consider as fair in this context? What would you, what would you think is the right approach? Yeah, I think most people would uh, agree with separation, right? So um, this is what our current legal standards are as far as I know, that we want the same rate of mistakes even if the outcomes are 
not the same, which might be caused by the actual true underlying distribution, whether people will commit another crime are different. This one's kind of interesting because I feel like this is, it stems from certain, uh, there's some other factors such as like how we were talking about the automated patrolling recommendation, which would feed into like who ends up in prison, which feeds into who's, you know, considered likely to recommit a crime. So I don't know, there's so much depth to this that like, do you just kind of control what you can control and so, so what we're measuring is not whether somebody predict, uh, commits another crime, but whether we catch somebody committing another crime. Right. right? And if our, if our metrics are biased, right, then we're calibrating our models wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you explain again, like, uh, how do we calculate these metrics, uh, like, for this particular problem? Sure. Um, it's the same as in this case. Um, so you need some sort of observation, either on training data or on evaluation data or in production data, where you can measure, where you can create um, confusion matrix. Uh, oh no. So what, what I meant to ask was, what would be false? What would be the meaning of false positive in this case? Like um, whether some. Sorry. I've written this down here. Um, among the defendants who would not have gone to commit another crime if released, um, the detention rates are the same. So what we're really thinking about is um, we're thinking that somebody will not commit another crime, but they do. Okay, right? so that's a wrong prediction. Or we're thinking that somebody will commit another crime, but they don't except that's something that we can in practice not observe, right? Because if we think they commit another crime, we detain them and then they have no chance of committing another crime. And if we're wrong, we don't know about this, which is a typical problem of um, whether we can actually measure um, whether we have ground truths for a lot of these problems. Make sense? Yeah, I, I think I got a little confused but with separation then. Like separation is both a false positive and false negatives to be low, correct? The same, not low. This, yeah, the same. But in this case, we cannot calculate false negatives. Yes, so, so um, you can define these for all kinds of things, right? So equalized odds, and I think separation refers to both things, but you can also equalize just the true positive rate. Oh, okay. um, or you can just uh, equalize accuracy, which we also don't know in this case because we don't know false positives. Yes, so this is a particularly hard example. Right. No, I think to your point, we, we kind of, oh no, you can't get false positives. If we don't release them, we don't know whether they would have committed another crime, right? Which is really annoying. Yeah, so false positives we can get, but we cannot get false negatives. Yeah, depending on what you define as a positive. Yeah, but yes, correct. Yeah. All right. So if we have a criteria in mind for a model, there's a couple of things that we can do at the modeling level. Um, and there's lots of papers on this and I don't wanna, I'm actually running out of time already, so I don't wanna go too much into this. Um, so the most common strategy, which is actually outside the model is to collect additional data on uh, groups that are performing poorly, right? So if you see that the model for women is performing much poorly, much more poorly, that's actually fairly common because we usually have less training data about women than about men or about the minority group in general than the majority group. Um, so we have less data, so our predictions are less accurate, right? So one strategy is just to collect more data about those groups specifically. Um, you might wanna be very careful in data cleaning about kind of that you're equally 
the data quality is similar, but there's also a bunch of things where you can reduce correlations and feature sets to kind of adjust for certain issues. Um, there are things where you can put constraints uh, like these fairness constraints directly into the learning algorithm. Uh, so one way is to encode these constraints as a loss function in some of this training algorithms. So they optimize not only for accuracy on the validation set, but also for fairness on the validation set. Um, by doing this, again, you typically gain lower accuracy, but you balance like multiple cr criteria um, because you constrain the degrees of freedom that the model has to learn this. Uh, and then there are post-processing steps, just things like adjusting thresholds uh, that we talked about. There's a lot of research in most of these techniques. There are a bunch of tools that you can automatically do, uh, use for calibrating things um, and playing with some data um, just to achieve certain metric goals. Right? Um, so as I said, there's almost always a trade-off between accuracy and fairness, um, simply because you restrict the degrees of freedom that the model has to make predictions. Um, so typically, at least for one group, you reduce the accuracy to balance it with the other group. Right? Uh, if you don't want to do this, the, the more useful strategy is collect more training data, get the other group um, to a similar level. Right? Reducing accuracy to be on par with a different group is easy. You just randomly insert a few mistakes, um, but that's yeah, that's an obvious thing that's not necessarily helping. So this I think is interesting. Um, um, there's a lot of discussions around fairness and that there are these different, um, uh, different groups. Um, this fairness tree, which is linked in the slides, has some, is a decision tree that gives you some help to select different metrics that might be usable in different outcomes. So, Um, so for example here, the first thing is um, essentially getting at equality versus um, e equity. Um, do you want disparate error, based on disparate errors or in disparate, disparate, uh, disparate representation? And then for errors, do you trust the labels? Um, and then there are a bunch of strategies, a bunch of different metrics, and then at the end you arrive at um, a bunch of metrics, some of them we have discussed, um, some of them, most of them we haven't, but things like um, different forms of parity, like false negatives, false positive parity uh, should be in there. Um, demographic parity, um, it's the one that is independence that we talked about first, right? So this was about representation, not about errors in the model. Um, and there's equal selection, like whether you want the same numbers or it should be proportional. So there, there are all these kind of metrics and which ones you pick depends on your problems and your requirements and your goals. Make sense? So the specifics you can look up when you need it, just saying there's a huge number of metrics and I think it helps to understand what you need. And in the end, in my view, that's a requirements engineering problem. Right? You need to figure out in the specific case, what do the stakeholders want? What's the thing that we want to achieve with the system or with society? How do we balance different conflicting goals? All right. Any questions so far? Otherwise I wanna go beyond the model. This is kind of what you had in the readings as well, right? So if you're actually doing this, what are all the steps that you need to take care of? And uh, the key lesson here is that it's really, fairness must be considered throughout the entire life cycle, right? So you need to think about this when you define the problem in the first place, when you collect data, when you think about the algorithm, um, that's maybe more the part that we talked about in training, but also how do you test it? Right? Do you have a plan to test for fairness? Do you collect the right metrics? Do you monitor fairness? Um, when you deploy it, how do you, do you consider fairness as part of canary releases, for example, or A-B testing? Um, 
do you collect the right amount, the right form of feedback that you would detect fairness problems? Right? All these kind of things, you really need to think about this throughout the development. And again, I think the most important part is probably during requirements. Um, from the paper that you read, um, I found this really interesting. There are lots of these challenges, right? So fairness is a system level property. So really just thinking about the one metric that you can collect about the model or about some test data is really not the thing. You really need to think about the system goals. You can think about user interaction design, data collection monitoring, uh, how you interact with the system, a bunch of things that we talked about before as well, right? So do you take automated actions? How do you deal with mistakes? Um, they talked about how there's typically a lot of flexibility in data collection, right? So for example, in your image classifier, you could make sure that you have the same number of training data across different demographics. Identifying blind spots is really hard. They talked about this in the paper, right? Um, are you going to be proactive or reactive? This, again, kind of, are you required by law? Are you doing this because you want to be fair, because it's ethic, the ethical thing to do, right? And then they talked about how even diverse teams will not think about all problems up front. So you might actually, uh, you need to talk to others, checklists might be a good solution, um, right? Kind of think through things. Um, there's not a lot of tooling and knowledge around fairness auditing uh, processes and tools. Um, they talked about problems of just debugging things. So if you if a problem gets reported, no, I thought I have this here. Like if somebody complains about a fairness problem, um, like I showed you the tweet la last time about how the Apple card is such a um, basic um, discriminatory program because his wife got a much lower credit rating, right? How do you figure out whether that's a one-off problem? Like the model will make mistakes, right? But why is this a systematic bias in the system? How do you figure this out? Um, if you figure out that there's a problem, what should you do? I mean, you can calibrate the models, you can kind of add more training data in some form, but what's the right approach, right? Uh, are you just chasing mistakes? Should you rather redesign the system? Um, there was a nice example in the paper about um, nurses versus doctors, do you remember this? Um, they had an image classification system and it was usually biased classifying women as nurses and men as doctors, right? And they fixed this by just changing the label to healthcare professional. So just sidestepping the discussion entirely, um, which might be a perfectly fine solution if you can't fix it in the model, right? If you can't get the training data um, to fix this. Um, and then also humans that might in the, in the loop are biased. So my take on this is um, really start early, think about this early. Think about this when you start thinking about the system, um, think about the system goals. And when you think about system goals, think about fairness concerns already. Kind of maybe go through a checklist. When you analyze risks, which I recommend you do anyway, right? Think also about fairness risks, and we talked about tools to do that. Um, understand feedback loops, right? Understand interactions with the environment and so on. Again, world versus machine, I think, is the right framework to think about this. We talked about this before. Um, influence data acquisition, if you can. Define quality assurance procedures. Like, make sure you have different test sets for both groups. Make sure you have the right telemetry to observe fairness in productions. Have an incidence response plan. Like, if somebody complains about fairness issues, how, how are you going to handle this? Right, uh, those kind of things. And in my book, those are mostly requirements engineering challenges, actually. So let's come to a different example where we're not incarcerating people Right? We're not misdiagnosing them with cancer, but we might be biased in some way in our transcription service. We're probably not required by law to provide the same quality of service for different groups. Uh, we might discriminate, but maybe we want to do the right thing. Right? So we wanna be careful when we're designing this thing. What kind of thing do you think we could do? What would you be concerned about? What might be 
possible fairness considerations, fairness problems. Um, Recognizing regional dialects, right? Dialects in general, accents, which might be strongly correlated again with um, protected attributes. So if we already know we are, we're concerned about this, right? Let's say um, kind of Native Americans might get a very poor performance out of our service because they speak with a certain dialect that we are not very well understanding, right? So let's say that's a group. We're probably not legally required to do this, but we want to do the right thing, right? So what could we do? Um, how would you start thinking about this? Do you have a fairness goal in mind, a fairness metric that we should achieve? Or is this about equal representation? Is this about equality, equity, representation or allocation? Let's start with the things we just talked about, um, kind of anti-discrimination versus separation versus independence. What do you think would be a good goal for us to achieve here? I think independence is hard. We don't have a binary outcome. Right, so kind of saying they get the same number of translations. Yeah, they do, they all get translations, right? But we could think about the kind of mistakes. So maybe we want to have similar accuracy across different dialects, right? We don't want um, that transcriptions of Native Americans perform way, way worse than anything else. Yeah, this could be a PR um, thing, right? If you, if you, and you have more customers, we talked about kind of benefits of this beyond just satisfying the law. Um, you provide equally good service to more people, right? So this would be allocation more than representation. Um, In this example, would we almost want to increase the number of um, features that may allude to uh, sort of like protected, like we, we almost want to be sort of guessing at their dialect based on not only their speech, but, but maybe like if we had the name of the speaker, you could start honing in on they're more likely to uh, be Native American speaking, things like that. Like, you want to increase yeah. it rather than decrease it. I, I would expect that the model picks on, up on this anyway. Mm -hmm. So we have a deep neural network that will, and the dialect is correlated with a protected attribute. Um, so I think any form of fairness by blindness is unrealistic anyway, right? Yeah. So we can't remove the features that are correlated. They are actually part of the thing here. So, um, we can explicitly add another feature, but I think it's already correlated and the model will probably already pick up on this. Um, we could test whether that helps, right? Um, mm. that's, that's certainly a thing. Um, so blindness is probably not the right approach. Um, so I think probably a good starting point would be just to monitor quality for different groups, right? And see whether we achieve some sort of parity on uh, accuracy and whatever our accuracy metric is. Um, I suspect strongly we won't, right? Um, 
we probably want some test cases, so have some test data on, um, on Native Americans. But probably the right intervention is collect way more training data, right? Which means you need sound snippets of Native Americans speaking, and then you need to transcribe them, right? So you can't just use the existing training data where um, people have transcribed like subtitles. If you just use subtitles from TV or so, which is already available for training, right? Which is very common that you use the data that's available for training because it's already labeled. Um, it's probably not the right representation. It probably underrepresents Native Americans by a lot. And you probably want to rethink your, your, your um, data collection strategy. What else can you do? Um, testing we talked about, designing telemetry. So this, this actually may mean that at least for telemetry, um, you might wanna collect um, the, the background or the demographic of the speaker, right? So you need to know that they're Native American that you can actually assess their accuracy separately. There might be a way that you can introduce this into the design that you can label speakers also with, at least for test data with maybe even in production with um, certain demographic attributes. Um, right. So I think there's no single solution here, right? And I think this is just a hard problem. Um, I think requirements engineers and software engineers in general have a lot to say. We can go through a couple of best practices that I just pulled out of a tutorial and just see whether we have some ideas um, about what we could do here. Right, so clearly identify the task and the model's intended effects. Yes, yeah, so the model translate things it probably doesn't have an indirect intended effect on representation or um, but we want to serve people equally well, right? Um, try to identify and document unintended biases and effects. So what are the groups for whom we might, that we might serve poorly, right? Um, clearly identify fairness requirements. This is what we just talked about. You might define um, the, that you want some sort of separation and measure this. Um, I think the last one is interesting. Um, redefine the task definition and be willing to abort Right, so if the model can't be achieved in a fair way, be willing to abort it and not do it. Like if you can't, like the hiring example from last week, if you can't do automated hiring in a fair way, maybe just cancel the project, which is what Amazon has done. Right? Rather than continuing encoding biases further. So for data collection, critically think before you collect any data Right? So are we just going to use subtitles from TV or can we use something else for training? Check for biases in our data source. Maybe even if we have subtitles for Native Americans in our TV selection, are those subtitles much poorer quality? Right? I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, try to identify societal biases that might be in the source. Um, think about cultural contexts. Um, think about the technology used to collect the data. Um, in this specific case, I can't think of many. I don't know, can you? I don't think that we have microphones that are differently working well for different population. Daniel? I, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's a technology necessarily, but uh, maybe the, the, um, we're transcribing from like a conference or something. So it could be the types of conferences we're collecting from is bias. Yeah. So humans involved in, in collecting data reminds me, if you speak to foreigners, uh, you often compensate for specific problems and you might speak much, much more slowly um, or explicitly um, if somebody has a dialect, right? So it might not be the natural way that they're speaking when you're collecting the data, but they, that they're just, you're, you're speaking to them in a different way that's not representative of actual data that you're going to use later. 
right? So there can certainly be all kinds of problems that, uh, that you can think here. Um, the question at the bottom, I think is also important. Um, and this is not all, always clear. Um, if you are trying to help an underrepresented or disadvantaged population, um, kind of collecting more data or asking them to provide more data often puts an additional burden on them, right? Which is causing potential problems. So you don't really want like the Native Americans to improve your transcription service um, or bear the cost for improving your transcription service. At least think about compensating it them for this, right? Um, very common problem in all kinds of diversity questions. Um, right, all kinds of issues that you could do when you're um, pre-processing the data that you may, may discard some data as too low quality or not useful for this, or you're labeling this or that your labelers have certain bias. Um, in the model definition, it's in testing and development, right? So check that the test data matches the deployment data. Um, we talked about that before. Ensure that the data, uh, the test data is actually representative of the population that you want to serve, right? Um, not necessarily of the population that you have right now. Um, continue to involve diverse stakeholders. Think about kind of problems throughout the testing process. Revisit all fairness requirements. Uh, Monitor continuously, monitor fairness metrics, monitor population shifts, monitor user reports and user complaints. Um, how do you figure out whether people actually have problems? What maybe they stop using your product? Um, right. Any any questions on this? Oops. Um, So these are mostly checklists and I don't think there's, there's really consensus yet on how to conduct a process, an audit, how to, what the right process is. But I think there's lots of things that you can think about. And a lot of this is at the system level, at the requirements level, partially at the user interface design level, or process of data collection and so on. Any questions, anything you wanna discuss? All right, um, uh, one more block, but I don't have much to talk about there. It's kind of redundant to parts of this. Um, data set construction, I think is often critical. Um, this was also part of the reading. Um, a lot of people actually have control over their data construction, right? So if you just take a machine learning course, you give them some data set and you have no control over what you're collecting. Um, right now in your homework, um, you have no control over what kind of data is available to you about, um, I mean, you can collect additional data about the movies, but about who's watching movies, what kind of demographic information do you have? Right? You can certainly think about fairness there as well. I think you have gender information, whether you're serving, uh, your recommendations are equally doing well for uh, across gender. Um, I think which is surprising if you come from kind of a classroom context where you're always given data is that in practice you often have influence, right? So you have influence about how much data you're collecting, what kind of data you're collecting. There's usually a lot of effort in collecting the right data and to labeling data. Um, and the most common strategy to address fairness issues seems to be not to fix the model, but to, but to collect more data. Right, so a lot of fairness issues come from, you just simply have very little training data on certain populations. Right, image recognition, kind of trying to detect the age of persons in an image performs, there's so many reports, performs poorly on women compared to men, simply because this is almost only, or mostly trained on male images. Similar for races, right, image uh, um recognition performs poorly on a black and Asian faces um, when trained on kind of majority populations in, in some data sets. But you can address this early in collecting data. And again, every stage in the kind of 
data collection, data cleaning, data processing steps uh, has possibilities to introduce bias. Data may come at different costs. They, uh, people might use the platforms that you're collecting data from to different rates and so on. Um, so again, lots of things to think through. Um, there are different biases like the, the demographic in your data set may not match the target uh, population, but maybe it also should not match the target population. Maybe it should be equal across target populations, right? So if you only have 10% of users from a minority, maybe you still need the same amount of training data from them, right? So just uniformly sampling might not be the right thing. And there, training on Twitter data or training on kind of public images that people take may not be representative of, of usage, right? So there's a lot of problems with kind of just opportunistically uh, collecting data. A lot of people train NLP models on Wikipedia and on the New York Times, right? How representative is this for uh, how diverse populations speak? Um, uh, different people might use different platforms and you get different biases from this. Um, um, here's an example that different freelancing platforms are used by different minorities or different population groups to different degrees. So if you're just sampling from one of them, you might get biased results. Um, and I think we talked most about this. Um, maybe data augmentation is an idea that we haven't talked about. Um, you can often synthesize, or sometimes synthesize data for minority groups. So for example, if gender is an issue in NLP, you just have more examples of he's a doctor than she's a doctor, and you know the rules behind it, you can just replace he and she to create parity uh, to, to lead the model to consider this more equally. Right, so data augmentation is a fairly common strategy where you take distributions from data, but then you create artificial extra data to balance out uh, kind of imbalances in your data sets. Right. Um, Two more things. Um, in terms of documentation, people start paying more attention to this. Data sheets is the recommendation fairly recent to describe the demographics in your training data and publish this as part of your model or part of uh, whatever you describe of the model. And uh, model cards are a similar strategy, but not about the train, only about the training data, but about the entire model. So if you're releasing a model, for example, Google has a model that detects um, toxicity and in interactions. So this trained on YouTube comments or New York Times comments, trying to detect whether people are kind of toxic and uh, offensive to each other. They describe what's the purpose of the model, um, what are the factors, what have we thought about in terms of ethical considerations, what kind of training data have we used, what kind of evaluation have we performed, does the model perform differently on different populations, kind of being more transparent, especially if you release a black box model to the world. Right? Um, so this is mostly what I have about fairness. Right? So we could go into this way more. Um, there's a huge amount of research. I think most of the research is about fairness at the model level. So lots of fairness definitions and their trade-offs and that you can't achieve them at the same results and what they are good for, right? So we talked about anti-classification, independence and separation, which are forms of classification parity, um, how they achieve equality or equity, um, that there's a trade-off between fairness and accuracy, how you can achieve this through post-processing or training constraints. So there's a lot of knowledge about this, a lot of tooling in the machine learning community. And I think the thing that's less commonly discussed is how to actually achieve this when you build this into a product, right? What to pay attention to um, at the system level. You really need to think about this throughout the life cycle. There's a lot of things to think about in data set construction and a lot of opportunities. And there are many, many challenges. And my view is really a lot of this are requirements engineering problems. Um, and I think there's a lot of things we can do better um, by just being aware of this and thinking about this. Um, and it, there are some best practices, but I think they're not very codified, but I think we'll get there in a few, few years. This is actively researched. All right.
Let me stop here and then I stick around for questions.